My background is actually in graphic design. I studied, lived, and worked in both Singapore and in London before actually moving to Berlin. And now I work for Books and Digital Lab as a product designer. And this is our lab. It's very nice by the river. But of course, the office here in Lisbon is also very lovely. <laughs> So what is pair designing? Before I jump into it, may I just have like, a quick show of hands? How many of you here have heard about pair design? I've never heard about it before I joined Digital Lab as well. Pair designing. If you're familiar with the agile development, you probably heard of the term pair programming. This is where two developers sit together and design on one cool thing. Um, so in simple terms, pairing is about two people working together as one. I'm sorry to burst your bubble, pairing, pair, pairing is actually nothing really new. In fact, Cooper, an interactive <laughs> design agency, have already started uh, this pioneering concept of pair, pair designing since 1997. That is over two decades. Another early adopters of pair designing is also Pivotal Labs, as Paul mentioned. We had the pleasure to work alongside with Pivotal Labs where we learn to work in agile value to customers more um, quicker and also more frequently. And agile, uh, and sorry, and pairing is actually one of the methods that we learned from them. So, how so one of um, the very common way of a pairing station looks something like this. You have two people sitting side by side, they have two keyboards, they have two mouse, and they have two screens, but they are mirrored, so there's only one workstation. Oh, I have this in my hand. Um, so yeah, it's basically two people, one workstation. So I'd like you all to right now, imagine you yourself on a road trip, but you're alone. So that means you're taking the wheel, you're driving, you're manning the accelerator, you know, you're manning also the, the brakes, and you're also reading and looking out for the directions. They're figuring out which direction should I go, and also you know, if there's any road alerts up ahead. But this sounds like a very stressful road trip. Now put yourself with someone else. So now you'll have another co-pilot in with you. This responsibility can be split. Somebody's the driver taking control of the wheel. So this is the person who is using the keyboard, using the mouse, um, using the whiteboard marker. These people are the generators. They are ones that are the makers. What that means is that they are the ones that are materializing the solutions. So they are in charge of making sure that the whiteboard is filled. It's not a blank canvas. On the other hand, you have the navigator. They are the one that are synthesizing the proposed solutions. They are the one that are constantly analyzing what the driver is doing. So they are always making sure also to keep the bigger picture in check so that you do not drive off course. And of course, these two roles does not have to just be each designer by themselves. It can be constantly switching. So the switching of the roles really depends on the pair. It can be very dynamic. For example, the driver could be telling the other pair, hey, look, I'm running out of steam. Can you please jump over? And now the roles are switched. <coughs> on the other hand, the navigator could also say something like, ah, I've got, a new idea. I've got a new idea. Can I please try this out? And again, the roles are switched. So it can be very dynamic. But if it doesn't work for a pair, it also can be a very structured time frame where you say, okay, first 30 minutes, I'll be the driver, and then the next 30 minutes, I can be the navigator. So now that I've talked about the what and the how, so I'll now share a little bit about why we pair design. I've summed it up into five points. And the first thing is shared knowledge and continuous learning. As a designer here, we all have something very different to bring to the table. Sure, we can call ourselves full stack designers, so I can do everything. I can do UI design, I can do UX design, I can do the user research, but of course, we all have our own strengths and our own weaknesses, right? And this is where pairing is really great for this, that you're always constantly learning from someone else. It's very more so often that we always pair some uh, de designers very differently. So someone who is probably as like myself, who is, has the background of graphic design, I'm more focused and confident in my UI skills, but maybe not so much in research. So when I pair with someone else, I'm learning something about uh, user research, about user experience, and you'll be actually very surprised when you pair, you learn so much more. So you do not just learn the skill sets, or you also learn about maybe some shortcuts that your pair have really used. Because of course, all those mini little seconds matters, right, about pressing certain shortcuts. All the tools that they use, or maybe even some new plugins that they use. 
So it's not just about the skill set that you learn, but also all these um, little things. Of course, you also learn about the different sort of experience that the other pair has brought. So for example, they might have some other experience about in their previous company where they face legal people, for example. This is something that they can share with you. So besides an individual skill set, there's also something else that you can learn from your pair, which is also um, the different ways that they work in the company. So for example, it's very, very rare that you have two designers joining the company at the same time. Someone who probably have more experience in the company or more experience um, working in the product. So when you're paired, you're already constantly um, sharing about the different sort of um, methods that you work in a company. You're already sharing about the product itself. You're also sharing about the different user problems that it's been faced and also about the business. So what this means is that you can already very quickly onboard somebody. And that brings on to my next point. You design better and faster. So when you have a new designer jumping on board, now they can really you know, get up to speed and learn about the product much quicker when you have someone right next to you who has so much knowledge about what they're already doing. You can have someone there who you can always question whenever you are unsure about things. So this is why it's much faster. Also another thing, I have also faced in my previous jobs where I was, um, I'm thrown onto a project, I receive the design files, and it's a huge mess. I don't know how many of you here have the similar problems, but somehow naming is a huge problem. It's like you see, and it's like, okay, copy artboard one, copy artboard two, <laughs> gosh, such a pain. And you spend so much time you know, going through that, really understanding the file or the structure or however the other designer has placed it. But in a pair, you become more mindful of this. You think about what makes sense for the other person and also um, about the future designers who will then join the team. So this is already a small bit of it that you already um, started to work on. And why do you design better? So if, as a solo designer, often you are thinking and doing in parallel, right? So you're already in your head, you know, solving things in your head, and you might miss out certain very minute details, and also sometimes you can be over complacent. But now when you're as a pair, you, the job can be split. Someone is you know, doing the driving, so that means someone is constantly generating and the other one is synthesizing. Also, you are then forced to have a conversation, right? You are now putting your thought process out loud. This means that you're constantly challenging and questioning one another. But not only that, that means you have to also explain yourself. You're always constantly explaining your, and rationalizing your thought process. This is kind of like a ping pong, right, with your partner. That means my um, ideas are built upon and of course they grow. That means, or what does that mean? Is that you're constantly validating yourself. That means uh, the, now the assumptions are becoming smaller. When that happens, you realize that now I have more confidence in what I've been building. Then your design is better. Now you have an idea of all the whys behind each solution that you're given. That brings on to my next point. That also means that with the confidence, it's because I know that someone's got my back. I know that when I go into a presentation full of managers or full of POs and stakeholders, I know that someone's got my back. Because you know, if a, someone from the stakeholder says, ah, but have you thought about ABC? And you can tell them, yeah, yeah, don't worry, we got this. We thought about ABC and we thought about X, Y, Z. You know, you've really, the thinking process has now been doubled. So you're more confident about the solution that you're presenting. And so another idea about someone's got your back is that now work doesn't stop. So, for example, if you're going on vacation, you do not need to worry about the deadline that is up ahead. You know, you know that someone is there to pick off where you um, left off. And many of the times, we also like to joke, yeah, I'm going to go on holiday, and when I'm back, you know, maybe the work is done. <laughs> Brings on to my fourth point, productivity without the burnout. When you're sitting with your pair, very much of the time, you're very focused, because you, the pair itself is the one who decides what focus on the task you have at hand. What does that mean? Is that you avoid avoiding difficult problems. So you know, instead when you hit some uh, robot, you'll be like, oh, yeah, but you know, we also need to clean up my file, so maybe I'll do that. But as a pair, you know, you decide about prioritizing. Okay, this is not the time right now to do some sort of cleanup work. We really need to solve this. So then this is the focus that you have. And also with a pair next to you, that means that you're less likely to be off, you know, up in the web, browsing your pet videos or chatting your messenger because now you have someone right next to you. Then you're very much in the focus and very much in the flow. And when you're in the flow of work, that means that you don't have interruptions. Because when people see you in a pair, you know, heavily in a discussion, 
it's very much likely that someone else will jump in and ask you some impromptu questions about some design work that's that very unlikely when you have a pair of so focused. So definitely you have the productivity there. And what does it mean with the, without the burnout? I know when I was designing alone in other previous companies, you know, you're always so focused about the deadlines that you're just constantly working, nine to five, nine to five, you don't take breaks. And really, this is very tiresome, not just on um, the brain itself, but also on the body, right? So when you're working as a pair, you also remind yourself to always take a break. Sometimes we tell each other, hey, do you want to play a game of ping pong? And this is also an interesting fact in our company, people are very competitive with ping pong. And I've learned. I've learned to get better at ping pong now, I think. Yeah, not, e not all Asians are good at ping pong. <laughs> Somehow they're always thinking like, yeah, you're good at ping pong, like, nope, nope, sorry. And lastly, it's fun. Pairing, I know it could be biased, but I think it's fun. You know, I really appreciate this sort of human interaction that I have with someone else, because when you're always working constantly on your screen, I really miss that, you know, having to talk to someone, and you'll be surprised how many inside jokes we have in a pair. And what's more, it's also that, you know, besides the higher quality work that you have, um, the more productivity, it's also about the shared happiness and the shared frustrations. So now, with the, with the shared success, the happiness is doubled. And with the shared frustrations, the pain is divided. So what are my learnings? You know, I've been pairing for now almost about two years. You know, every time when you're with a pair, you have, you know, you're always constantly together, you get made fun of. People are like, ah, oh, you guys are like a married couple, you know. You start dressing the same, you start saying the same thing. They're always going out to eat lunch together. And it's true. Pairing is like marriage, you know. It, it's not perfect. And you really need to work together to make things work. You know, one of the very basic things about success in marriage, sorry, I'm not married, but I think it is one of the basic things, is that you need to trust each other and you need to respect each other. It's not about who is the, who is the better designer. And also, of course, you need to be really patient with one another because you know, each designer has a different pace of how they're designing. This is somewhere where you really need to be like, patient with one another. Another thing about um, you know, being saying that pairing is like marriage is that you really need to talk to one another and really listen. And really listen, not just like, yeah, da, 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 da. <laughs> no. So, talk, what do I mean by talk? I mean by really putting out there, if you don't know anything, you no know, question, talk to your parent, I don't understand this, can you please explain it to me? And not just about you know, work itself, if you have any personal feelings, talk it out. One thing I practice with my parent is to have a retrospective. So, this is something where you, think, you reflect on what you've learned, about what can be improved, and this can be done. You know, just two of you. you uh, what we do is we normally draw a sad face, then a not so sad or not so happy face, and then a happy face. And then you really just write everything on the board. So you have it out visually for you to see. And this is also means that you don't just focus on the bad points, but you also talk about the good things and what happened within the pair. So this is a very good way to uh, really talk it out. Um, and one last thing about you know, saying that pairing is like ma uh, marriage is that you also need to give your pair sometimes space, right? Let there be space in marriage, you say. What does it mean is that, you know, as it might be different for developers where they have to usually pair 100% of the time. It's not so much for designers. The pair, the pair decides how they would like to pair. You don't need to be pairing 100% of the time for designers because it's very much like, you, as a designer, you want the freedom to explore. You want the freedom to you know, try out new ideas, and this is where you can say, okay, you know, let's diverge a little bit, and then come back. And then this is where you also have better solutions, right? And lastly, another learning for me is that pairing is really just not for everybody. This is a fact that you have to accept. Some people as you know, comfortable just designing a lot, and that's fine, right? It's, it's, it's just how people are. You're not, it also takes quality to be able to design and to pair, sorry, and it's always, it's not easy because pairing can be really a toll, right? You're always talking to one another and this is something that we always say that as a designer, you take such um, pride in your work because you really put a lot of thought effort into it and some of your pair who's telling you, yeah, no, that shit. This is like literally killing your baby and it hurts. And honestly, it hurts. Sometimes you really just also need to hear other people's um, uh, feedback about things to really talk it out and, and not so much just focus within the pair. So you really need to be open-minded, you really need to be able to let go, and yeah, these are some of the qualities that you, be, you need to have um, to be able to pair. Another thing, not just individually, saying that it's not for everybody, 
it might not also work for the company if it's too bent on hierarchy. So if it's all about you know the senior who gets uh, the final say in things, then perhaps this is not something that will work for you. And yeah, I'll just leave you with this sentence inspired by Anna. Pairing is sharing, and sharing is caring. Thank you. You can look for these three lovely faces. They're more than happy to tell you more about it. Yeah, that's it on my side. Niger. Niger is a digital studio uh, and it's focused on uh, digital projects that have purpose in mind. Uh, I'm also the design director at Spotify, which is a fitness platform um, that uh, empowers gym owners, coaches and athletes to lead more fulfilled lives. And I'm not sure if you're noticing a team, but for me, purpose is really important in the things that I do. So. Today I'm not going to talk to you about the new cool trends of uh, uh, new ways of design. I think that's very important, but I want to talk about, uh, you know, what drives us first. Um, and I'm really happy to be here with Melissa and Pedro because I'm learning a lot from them. So thank you as well for being here. So, context. Uh, purpose. Purpose is a noun. And what I did as a designer was going back and research what it means, so I went to the dictionary, and it says that purpose is the reason something exists. So it's the meaning why uh, people do things. It's a person's sense of resolve and determination. And it's the motive and the motivation and the reason why uh, we do what we do. So why? Do I think designers should care about purpose? Because we're designers, so the why is the most important thing on what we do. So if the purpose is why, the purpose gives meaning to life. And if it gives meaning to life, it will guide our ambitions and it will also be our motivator. And uh, if it's our motivator, it's what drives our decisions. And purpose us, provides us with the courage and the enthusiasm to do things that sometimes are not easy. And if you're a designer, you know that it's not easy. Everybody has opinions, which suck. And, um, um, and I think it's really important right now to have a purpose because I think things are about to get really, really, really tough. So, we are here. And... Uh, 
I just took this randomly, so we're not exactly there. And um, what we know is very, very little. So we only know about 4% uh, of the universe. Um, from all the stars, planets, and galaxies that we can see today, we only know about 4%. Uh, other 96%, we have no idea what it is. We can see it, we don't understand it, we don't comprehend. And this is important because most of the times we are really sure about our decisions. And I think that we shouldn't be so sure and we should just experiment a little bit more. So even if we zoom in on Earth, which is like the place that we live, we know a little bit more, but still we don't know a lot. Um, and so when I started to think about this talk, the new ways of design, I was thinking maybe I can talk about research, data-driven design, I can talk about the things that I'm doing, I can talk about cool organizations that are doing cool things. Uh, but uh, mostly I thought uh, about the future. And uh, I know nothing about the future. I don't think that we can really predict the future. But if we research a little bit and we look back to the past, we might find some clues about the future. And so that's what I did. I read a lot. So this was a good way for me to spend two days doing nothing about <laughs> life and just reading. Um, so what can the past uh, tell us about the future of design? If we look at our recent past, uh, we had a number of uh, revolutions. Um, what these revolutions have in common is that they happen and occurred when three types of technological advances happen. So, Either we improve the way that we move goods around, or the way that we communicate with each other and manage information, or the way we power our economies. And we, this is really important, because if you look at the current state, we are on the sweet spot for this to happen. So, uh, another thing that is interesting in, uh, regarding these revolutions is that they completely change the way that we live. So, from one revolution to the other, everything you knew was garbage, right? So you need to learn new ways of doing things. So let's look back a little bit. So, first industrial revolution. You take water, and water is, you know, one of the basic elements. And somehow you find that if you boil water, you can have steam, and if you have steam, you can power through things. So the first uh, revolution was just about water, which is really simple. It was in the middle of the 18th century, and basically, water created the railroad. Okay, so right now we can move things around. You still listen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, let's go to the second. The second is always easier because you learn something from the first. So, you take what you learn and you mix it, and everything is a remix, and so you get mass production. So what you do is you take the powers of the first revolution, you put them all together, you grow the industry, you create, you make people go to a factory, you give them 40 hours work week, you change their sleeping patterns, and there you have it, boom, <laughs> change, right. So, third revolution. This one you should know about, at least. Um, it's, uh, it started in the 60s. I love the little child, you cannot see because this is low res. But, you know. Um, and the re digital revolution, so who doesn't have a smartphone? Okay, so there you have it. That's what the, the digital revolution is. Uh, basically, it gave us smartphones, it gave us the internet, and the internet is the most amazing thing in the universe. It gave us uh, a lot of stuff. Yeah, Autom automatization, which is really interesting, because if you look to the future and where we are now, and I think we are on the verge of the fourth uh, industrial revolution, you can look at automation and artificial intelligence to see what will happen next. So if you think about this, all the new technologies that people are talking, and most of them we know very little of, so if we think about robots, if we think about the Internet of Things and the systems crashing because all the machines are there to kill us, if you think about autonomous vehicles and Google and the robots and all the weird dogs running in the fields, 
then it can be pretty scary to think about the future. But it can still be very interesting to think about the future as well. So someone that is much smarter than me, the founder and chairman of the World Economic Forum, said that uh, the fourth revolution will be like something that we never seen. We cannot even predict what is going to happen. We don't have the knowledge and we are not intelligent enough to know what will happen when machines are smarter than us. So if we don't do that, uh, how do we design, right? How we as designers are going to design the future, how do we think about new ways of designing if we don't know what is going to happen? And why should we care about the, these changes on technology? Because the changes in technology is what's powering the world right now. We as designers must uh, catch up. And if we think about the future, if we think about automation, if we think about IE, and we know that machines and automation are, are going to take at least 30% of the jobs, which is not bad, like all the boring jobs can end. Um, 30% of the hours that we work right now will be automated by 2030. And if we know that uh, 5 million occupations, 5 million job descriptions will cease to exist by next year, then the workforce of the future is not exactly what we are doing right now. And so we need to adapt. Um, and I think for us designers it's good because if we look at the things that are going to cease to exist, it's not necessarily the skill that we have, and designers are very well equipped to keep on working on the future. So what will decrease is every job that can be taken over by a machine. What will not decrease is every job that cannot be uh, taken over by a machine. So how can we future prove ourselves, right? What are the skills that we need to start learning to do this? So, I think this is easy, right? Collaboration. We are working on uh, remote teams. We are working on uh, uh, cross-functional teams. We are working with no teams so and with clients. So collaboration is the basis of what we do. We need to get better at it. And it needs to start with us, you know, because we are the designers and we are good. So it starts also with communication. We are terrible at communication. We are terrible at justifying our decisions. We are terrible at gathering consensus. So we need to get better at this. Uh, the other thing that is going to be really needed is uh, complex problem solving. And if we know that machines are already better than us in most singular tasks, right? Why do we need complex so uh, problem solving? Well, everything that we do, companies that we work for, we'll still need to develop new products and new services in order to make money and to have a nice life. So, problem solving will always exist. And even though machines might be better at some specific tasks, they are still not better at us at making connections between things. So, while they are not there yet, we should take advantage of that. And then, the other one that is very, very important is emotional intelligence, I think. So, understanding how other people feel, how other people react to you, what other people care about, what day of the week is better to have that meeting because you know that the people will say yes to what you want. It's important to everything, not only to, you know, get the right job, get the right interview, get the right client, but for you to feel better about the world and about yourself. So, cry a lot, I cry a lot, but emotional intelligence is really what you need to move forward. Um, and if we think about machine learning and artificial intelligence, this is not something that is going to be there soon. So again, invest in that. Um, decision making and critical thinking. So the world is getting more complex, right? There's more data available to us. And we need to make decisions all the time. So if you look at Mark Zuckerberg, he wears the same thing all the time because he wants to reduce the amount of decisions that he has to make during the day. So just making decisions and being able to make decisions and not just making decisions, but being able to justify your decisions with research is very important. It's something that designers are still terrible at doing 
I manage two teams, I am a designer, and I need to convince my clients, and still it's very difficult. So, the last one is curiosity and creativity. And I think this is why most designers get into design. They want to solve something, they want to make something look and work great. Um, and uh, creativity is something that robots won't be able to do soon. They, they learn by what we teach them. And if we think about what we are creating, the reason there's com uh, computers, the reason there's robots, the reason there's either the reason that there's internet of things, is because of humans. So if we keep on doing this, then uh, we shall be there. So going back to the beginning, purpose. For me, purpose meaning that you need to be very careful about designing your learnings, designing your career, designing your life. And uh, I'm very careful uh, about doing that. That's why I created a company, so that I can design the way that we work together. It's not easy. Most of the times you just, you know, you just tire and <laughs> you fail by uh, giving up. But I don't think we'll give up because we're very happy together. Uh, and I want to leave you uh, with a little bit of uh, food for thought and for you to think about what you should be doing with your life if design is really the thing that you want to do. And the questions that I have for you, and I'm almost uh, finishing, are what are, your, what are your priorities? What are the things that are driving you now? Uh, in the face of change and the unknown, uh, what do you value the most? <coughs> and finally, what problems do you want to solve? What are the new ways that you're going to be designing? Thank you, Leila, as well, for your presentations. There's a lot of what you were talking that connects back to my presentation, so I'll probably repeat a lot of what you just said, which is good. This is validation. Uh, so yeah, my name is Pedro. I'm a senior UX designer uh, at GitLab, uh, and I'll be talking to you about remote work and also working in the open, designing in the open. So the first thing I want to ask you is, so we, we're, you're good at the work that you do, but things are just Okay, and let's see if you uh, if anyone, uh, if this, these statements resonate with any of you. So the first one is, your colleagues and clients uh, trust you. So who feels that this is true in their work? You can raise your hands. Okay, 50-50. Uh, some people will think they trust you. Okay. Uh, so the second statement is, your users are happy. Can raise your hands again. <laughs> okay, this is this is bad. Okay. I wasn't expecting to be this bad. We have to make it's something. What? It's the human condition. Okay, yeah, to always feel like you're not doing enough. Right. Um, and now you don't need to to raise your hands, but there's also this feeling that even though your work is okay. Uh, you're kind of happy, or better yet, you're conformed with what you're being paid, right? Uh, it's it's rare, I think, in this room for anyone to say, no, I I feel like I'm 
earning a blast. It's much better than cryptocurrencies. Uh, thank God I left that a while ago. Um, and you also hope that doing all of your work, uh, that your portfolio and your resume are automatically generating, uh, uh, are automatically building up by themselves. And this will lead you to better clients and better work. The work that fits you, that has that purpose, that meaning, etc. That, that none of that feeling of maybe I'm not doing enough, maybe it's not uh, what I should be working for. The thing is, it's not your fault, right? Uh, it's not your fault because generally speaking, people have problems trusting creative people, right? You know that? Creative people that go to their home, like, you know, <laughs> things like that. Um, users are not included in projects, and we can see that just now when people were raising their hands. People don't know if they're happy, if their users are happy or not. And many people also don't know if they're also happy. Um, and also design is undervalued. And when I say undervalued, I also mean underpaid, right? Because uh, all of this goes back to a part of the problem, right? We, we're one part of the problem, the other part of the problem is the people that we work with in the community. So part of the problem is that designers aren't good at communicating their work, right? Uh, and this is basically because we tend to design behind closed doors. And designing behind closed doors is holding you and the industry back, the whole design community. Uh, and this is really easy for me to say while standing here, uh, but it's really hard to put into practice and to really improve uh, and to make everything better. Um, so what I want you to, basically the, the positive note now is that you can be better and that things can be better. So let me introduce you to designing in the open. So maybe some of you are already familiar with, with what designing in the open is, or it can be forward. It means sharing the work of an ongoing design project as publicly as possible. Uh, and this, what this does, it increases the quality of your work and also the trust that other people have in your work and also that you have on your own work. Uh, and now everyone is asking, are you crazy? I'm going to share my designs. Are you mad? I didn't need to work on the designs and I didn't do that big unveiling like on this stage showing my clients, right? So let's break this down so it's less uh, intimidating. So the first part is work. So let's, uh, I'll go on and, and define what this kind of work means. And then the second part is, what do we mean by as publicly as possible? Because there is a lot of change in this, and what considered to be public. Uh, so what can we share? What are the shareables? So we can be, your tasks, what am I doing now? And you can share that with your clients internally, even your team. Sometimes they don't have visibility on what you're doing. Uh, the other part is design assets, right? Source files, sketch files. Uh, forget your competitive advantage and building like amazing things that only you have access. You can also share your source files. Uh, you can share your case studies, uh, your process, what you're doing, what happened, what were the learnings, what were the failures. You can also share your research findings, right? Most of the scientific, that scientific community already does that. They share their uh, findings, and everyone learns from it, and this is why we can cure a lot of the diseases. Let's imagine that we can also cure the diseases in our project so that our users can be happy, right, if we share all of the findings. Um, you can also share tools, things that you've built internally that help you work better. Maybe other people from the design community can use those tools to help also build better projects. Um, now the publicness, w who can I share with? And this is, uh, I think it's a scale that I try to outline, which I think uh, kind of covers everything uh, and everyone in between. So the first is the world, right? This is the most daunting. You share everything with the world, and this is usually possible because you're in an open source project, uh, like I am at GitLab. Uh, you work for the government or a public institution, generally, right? Uh, then you also have the user community. And sometimes this works for closed source products. Uh, and so you are sharing what you're doing, but they don't have necessarily a visibility into everything that you're doing. Uh, and these two, I think, are the key, um, the key uh, audiences that everyone can make an impact and can start doing tomorrow. Uh, then you have clients. Okay, this is a no-brainer. You can share what you're doing with the clients. 99.9% of the projects, uh, your department, and your project team. 
right? The project team goes back a little bit to what Melissa was saying of pair programming. So share your process, share your deliverable, share what you're doing right now, what you're thinking, when you're failing, uh, when, when you're succeeding. And you, it's, it's not a question, right? Everyone shares their work with themselves. So this, the change is hard, right? And people don't like to change. Everyone knows that. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit of a, a story. So I work for GitLab. Who knows about GitLab here? Oh my god, really? <laughs> this is getting better. Each, each talk I give, it's, it's more hands up. Yeah, nice. Um, I'm happy about it. It's, it's GitLab, not GitHub. You know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> what a twist. <laughs> OK. Maybe if we raise again the hands, it'll be less hands. Uh, so what is GitLab for you, uh, for those of you that don't know? So GitLab is an open source tool. Um, that is focused on helping people collaborate on software development. And you can go from your initial idea to deploying whatever you thought was best for your users to production and putting them in their hands. Um, and it is used by over uh, 100,000 organizations such as NASA, Uber and Sony uh, and others. And uh, it basically unifies um, code repository, project management, continuous integration and deployment, monitoring your application. It's a mouthful. It's a lot. Um, and the key to all of this is remote work. Again, it goes back to uh, what Leila was sharing. This is only possible because of the digital revolution, because we have smartphones in our hands, and you can talk with each other, to each other. So we have over 2,000 contributors, and we have 535 GitLabers in 52 countries. And this was just updated today, because yesterday the numbers were different. Uh, so we're growing a lot. And this is the audience that my work is visible to today. So those people can influence, if they want, they can influence and be part of the conversation uh, when we're building something, when we're changing something uh, in the product. It's a remote-only organization. There are no offices. So what do we share with the world? So we share our tasks. Very simple. You can see everything that we're doing right now and that we're planning to do. And you can also suggest things for us to do. Uh, we open source our design files, our pattern library, UIs, icons, illustrations. Uh, we also are open about our artifacts, our deliverables, what are, is our process, sketches. Uh, we also share previews and teasers of what we're doing through Dribble uh, and tweets. And we do this so we can ask for participation from the community because we have a lot of issues and it's difficult to really understand where people can start working. Um, we are also open about our stories and case studies. Uh, this is, a lot of people do this. Um, and we're, one of the things I'm really proud about is that we're open in our research and findings. So not only what we thought about doing and we did what we did, but also the videos and the findings and the recommendations themselves. And all of this is open, or at least we try for it to be as open as possible, as long as uh, everyone agrees in the research study. Uh, and this is a one I really like. Uh, also, open tools, a lot of nerd stuff. Um, and so why, why does it matter, right? It goes back to my initial point. Our industry needs more credibility. Uh, and I have to be honest, because uh, designing in the open was a big change for me when I joined GitLab. Before that, I was always working behind closed doors in consultancies and startups, everything was closed, it was only for the internal team. Um, and it really changed the way I look at design, I look at work, um, and increase the value and trust my own work. And I ended up learning a lot about myself, about my strengths and weaknesses, uh, and that I'm really afraid to do this, but it's still worth it. Uh, so common issues that people raise, uh, and maybe you would raise them in the, in the panel, so I'll start by uh, answering them right now. So, but people will steal my ideas. Yeah, but don't be paranoid about your competitive advantage, right? Because everyone can have good ideas, but only some people actually implement and do those ideas. So be the first to do them and be the best at doing those ideas and implementing them. But it feels so uncomfortable sharing my work. Yeah, it's normal. If it's uncomfortable, it's because you're doing it right. It's like iteration which is one of our values at GitLab. Uh, and this, um, this feeling of being uncomfortable maps to a thing that I, I found online, which is called 
uh, our designer maturity o meter, uh, which is coined by Ryan Singer. So it's really interesting, uh, and, and you will relate to some of this. So the first point is, let me work and I'll get back to you, right? The designer that says this is the designer that works in a cave, right? <laughs> they work in a cave, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I got it. Don't, don't worry, I'll get back to you, right? Um, and usually we design an experiments with our project in secret. It's all secret stuff, right? And then the big unveil and the surprise, and it all goes wrong, and no one likes it. <laughs> Guess what? Uh, the second step is check out these wireframes. So now we're already sharing some things. We're more mature. You notice that, right? You have this feeling of more confident. Um, so we share specific steps, and we know that the feedback will help us get to the right place, will lead us and guide us to the right direction. Uh, and then the third level, which is like Nirvana, right? Let me design, let's design it together right now. What Melissa was saying, pair designing. Right? It's easy when it's another designer, but let's, let's pair design with everyone. Uh, it's, it's dangerous, but let's, let's try it. Uh, so when you do that, you're uh, open to sharing your rationale about what you're doing with other people, no matter what industry and what background they have and what role. Uh, and this will also help formulate new ideas and iterate <coughs> on your design. Uh, another point, but not everyone knows how to give feedback. <laughs> I don't know why I'm always using this Keanu Reeves voice, but it works. Uh, yeah. So uh, not everyone knows how to give feedback. You'll get good feedback and bad feedback. That happens to any kind of project. And the key here is to know uh, and share exactly what kind of feedback you're looking for, and also teach people how to give feedback. Most people are really terrible at giving feedback. They don't know how to give feedback. Um, and it, it should be something that is taught everywhere, right? Uh, it's, it's a bit like sharing your, your feelings, and yeah. Let's talk about that later. Um, so, and one of the, the final ones is, but haven't you heard about design by committee? Yeah, this, you got me on this one, right? This is a real problem, but it's actually a problem for every project. It is, and it's in your hands to control uh, how design by committee affects what you do. Um, and finally, but doesn't it take more time? So the short answer is yes. Everything takes a little bit more time. And the long answer is yes. But you have to look at the big picture. And what is the big picture? So the big picture, also known as benefits, is that it brings clarity to your own work. You feel more accountable. You own your work. You feel more trustworthy. And you feel more confident about what you're doing. You end up learning more, and you progress on that maturity scale, right? Uh, your clients, colleagues, and users feel included and valued. This, bring, this helps bring a more point of views. They feel like they can pitch whatever idea they have, uh, and uh, you're ex in the end, you're seen as the expert because you're facilitating the discussions uh, instead of leading the discussions and telling them what to do. It also builds interest in the community and gets everyone's attention about what you do. Uh, another point is you get diverse feedback from a wider group of people. This is really important because often when you have more eyes looking at an idea or a solution, you, get, you catch those mistakes earlier, right? Uh, and this is especially important when you're dealing with uh, people from other countries, right? You, get, you don't understand how a button is now breaking because the translation is actually much longer than what you thought it would be in English or some things might affect them uh, in terms of their ethics, right? And so on. And um, finally, other people learn from what you did right or wrong. And we use this all the time. So we use a lot of open source products, right? We really like to go to the nonproject.com and download that icon without mentioning who did that icon, right? We all always use other people's works and we're influenced by them. Um, so this is also one of the points and gets, gets more, more uh, recognition. There's also another bonus point here that I forget to mention, but I think it's a silver lining to everything I'm saying, is that when you're sharing in the open and you're doing all of this work, it, well, it's a little bit of work, but you're actually uh, saving yourself time in the future because you're building your resume and your portfolio so that you can get the clients and the work that you want to do, right? 
And most of the times when you want to switch jobs or you want another client, you think, well, now I have to rebuild my portfolio, now I have to rebuild my resume, and I get stuck designing my own logo, right? That's what happens to everyone. Uh, so some examples of uh, what, how others are designing in the open. A really famous example by Brad Frost is when he worked on a project for a nonprofit, the Great Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank. Uh, and he links to a blog post. He has his own project hub, which is what you're seeing here, which is completely public. You can go in there and see all of the milestones of the project and what were the deliverables. Uh, and he also open sourced this project hub. So you can grab it and change it to fit your project as well. Uh, another example, which goes back to that levels of publicliness, is the gov.uk. So the United Kingdom government uh, digital service, their internal agency, he, they open source everything. They have a blog post, they have alpha websites, they have their own community for people in the country to voice their concerns about what digital services look like and should behave. Uh, we also have another level of uh, publicness, a Portuguese agency, a digital agency, who is not completely open, but at least they give visibility to their clients in another level. Like they have a backstage, they have a project diary, they have written photo, video communication, documentation, and the project management. And everything is public, right? The, the client can see exactly what they're working. Um, so now, if you can do any of this, you can also contribute to open source projects, right? You can contribute to GitLab, Mozilla, Ubuntu, or WordPress, which are really famous projects. Um, and so my call to you is to start doing it now, right? Just do it. So how you can start doing it? If you don't have one, create a Dribbble account uh, and post what you're doing. It doesn't matter if it's really fancy, if it's the next. Uh, weather app or to-do app, just post what you're doing. It really helps to get free of that feeling of uncertainty and frustration. Promote open design your company team and explain the benefits, right? Exactly what I'm explaining here. I will share the presentation later, later and it's an open source presentation, so you can copy the text exactly. It's not a weird PDF that it's all closed. Um, make room for your team to share the work. Right? Sometimes you need to create the right environment and the time for the team to share the work, to feel safe, that they're not going to be criticized. And this is really important if you're leading a team. Share your processes, tools, and findings. And tomorrow morning, think about what you can do to make the project that you're working on more open. It can be a little thing, but it really helps. So, Again, if you can do any of this, there's still a way, right, to give back to the open. As I said, contribute to our GitLab UX. You can check our issues and uh, contribute with what you know. Mozilla, they have their own repository on GitHub, uh, where you can see basically requests of what the Mozilla organization needs from designers. Like, we need this logo, we need this t-shirt. Most things are graphic design. Uh, there are some UI things as well. But you never know. It's a good way to start. So what I want you to leave this room thinking is that embracing designing the open is really amazing and unforgettable, right? And that you learn a lot by doing it. You learn a lot about yourself. Other people learn a lot about your craft, why you do the things you do, and design is not, no longer a mystery. It's no longer that creative process that people go into the hole and, right? <laughs> Thank you. And also, I want to thank you, Brett Frost, Matthew Crane, Open Design Foundation, Ryan Singh, and Sean Martel, which I based a lot of my presentation. Thank you.